Hi everyone, here's the bookcamps once again, and thank you so much for all your contributions to my Gravity's Rainbow reading project. I was very happy to see that so many people were enjoying their reading, be it their first read or uh, second time through Thomas Pinch's Gravity's Rainbow. I've read from so many people in the comments saying that they were expecting a much tougher and much hard, much more heartless experience, and that instead they found so much uh, emotional content and emotional depth in the first hundred pages of the novel. I definitely agree. Um, I think Jessica and Roger Mexico are probably everybody's favorite characters. I do definitely agree. Uh, I also agree with people saying that if they didn't know better or if they hadn't read the novel, they would think that uh, Roger was going to be the protagonist of Gravity's Rainbow. Uh, that's definitely the case, definitely the impression from the first hundred pages. I also did not remember from my first read that Pirate Prentice played such an important role in the novel, but he is definitely another major character. Anyway, today in this video I am going to discuss the second half of part one beyond the zero uh, and by the way as with all other videos in this series in the description box you'll find a list of what sections of the book I'm discussing in each of the videos but first before I talk about this second this section the second half of part one I'm going to address some of the things I mentioned in the first video and I'm going to um, re respond to a few of your comments on the first part on the first hundred pages of Gravity's Rainbow. So many people enjoy the dream sequence with the giant Adenoid. It's a great sequence, it's so fun. And a commenter called Mariano Falzone said that he thought it was maybe inspired by Godzilla and other monster kaiju movies from the 50s. I actually remember one part uh, later into the novel with um, that involves a giant octopus. Uh, I remember when I first read that part I thought of 1950s monster movies. I'm a huge fan of monster movies and Mariano Falzone also mentioned that the, uh, apparently uh, Pinchon is a big Godzilla fan and at one point he was writing a Godzilla novel. Are you kidding me? It really ruined my day when I read that because it's a great tragedy to me that the world is never going to see Thomas Pynchon's Godzilla novel. Are you serious? Also, in the last video I asked you guys what Beyond the Zero, uh, the uh, title of the section which comes from a quotation in the first hundred pages of the book or so, actually means, what it refers to, and there were so many comments and so much feedback, and Mariano uh, and also a few others, also a commenter called Bums Manifest who is a great commenter, um, mentioned that it may have something to do with Pynchon's obsession of ideas of life beyond death, which is definitely, are definitely present throughout the entire section. And in, more broadly speaking, with, idea, with ideas of what lies beyond the border of anything, beyond the border of the surface web in Bleeding Edge, beyond the geographical uh, and uh, geographical borders both in, ge in um, uh, conventional terms when it comes to borders between nations and in natural terms, in more uh, spiritual terms even, uh, when it comes to borders of the mind, you know, Pynchon's old obsession with paranoia, and spiritual borders between the perceivable and unperceivable world. And Bum's Manifesto also crucially pointed at the uh, epigraph of the section, which I, forget, I forgot to mention in the last video, but is actually crucial. Uh, it's from Werner von Braun, who is a famous uh, German scientist and the so-called father of the V2 rocket. Um, and the quote goes, Nature does not know extinction, all it knows is transformation. Everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual ex existence after death. Which is a beautiful quote and definitely has something to do with all the um, topics and themes in this section with these paranormal themes of life after death. In the section we read in the last two weeks there's even a, um, uh, a scene where people talk with the ghost of a famous German politician and I was never sure whether this epigraph should be read ironically because it can definitely be read as straight up serious, it definitely relates to so many of the themes that are carried on and are discussed in this third section, but at the same time the person saying this, stating his belief in life after death, 
is the father of the V2 rocket, the man who basically invented these missiles and who, in a way, is responsible for all of the terrible deaths you keep reading in this section. It seems to me that the implied reply to the epigraph is, oh, you do believe in life after death, don't you, Werner? That's convenient. Uh, there's a beautiful song by Tom Lehrer about Werner von Braun, I'll put a link in the description box. I've always felt the epigraph to be a little bit in that same vein. Also, the epigraph is very relevant to Michael Chabon's Moonglow, one of my favorite Chabon's novels and my favorite novels in general, and definitely 100% a piece of Gravity's Rainbow fan fiction by Chabon's own admission. Uh, fun fact, did you know that Michael Chabon apparently put uh, Pinchon Easter eggs in all of his novels because he's a big fan. I personally have not found more than maybe one or two and I'm not certain about those either. Uh, anyway, Moonglow is definitely a much more enjoyable novel than Gravity's Rainbow for all that it is. Uh, GR fan fiction has nothing to do with Gravity's Rainbow in terms of style. It has lots to do in terms of uh, themes and other th stuff. Uh, definitely a recommendation for when you're done with uh, Gravity's Rainbow. Back to Pynchon. Thanks to a commenter called Dominic Kukic, whose name I hope I'm pronouncing right, who mentioned that the quote from which Beyond the Zero is lifted, um, the uh, passage uh, which I read to you in the last video from late in the first section we read, apparently comes directly from Pavlov, is a direct quotation from Pavlov the scientist himself. And speaking of the meaning of that section, another commenter called Jem Reason mentioned the uh, concept of extinction in psychology, according to which sometimes uh, conditioning to a stimulus may disappear, may be cancelled, but the conditioning may still reappear at a later stage, uh, by means of a different stimulus from the first one, an unexpected one maybe, which definitely is related to the whole mystery of why uh, the rockets appear to be falling uh, in places where Slothrop is having erections. Um, in general, I think that all of, these, um, all of these threads, all of these images are difficult to balance for the very simple fact that each of these structure, each of these reflections, each of these psychological concepts are also connected with other themes and other concepts. This idea of beyond the zero may relate to spirituality, may relate to life after death, may relate directly, as it apparently does, to psychology. That's what complicates the whole thing, and it's definitely the text's purpose to create this state of constant uncertainty, um, which, by the way, fosters beautiful paranoia in the reader. Finally, and here I'll connect with today's section, many of you mentioned the presence, the great presence of Pynchon's voice, I'm not going to call him Pynchon because that's misleading, of the narrator's voice in relating the story. The narrator in this novel is definitely audible, very often he will address you directly, or at least talk in the second person, and very often he will give you and contribute his opinion, his or her opinion, on the text, on what's going on, on the dynamics of war. In the section we read, I read in the last two weeks, there was a beautiful passage where Pinch, once again, the narrator detailed the fact that war is about commerce, it's a form of trade and that all the dying and all the destruction is just a way to stimulate more trade, which is a terribly bleak and tragic worldview, but also very convincing in a very sinister way. One thing some commenters remarked upon, which I totally agree, is the fact that Gravity's Rainbow is definitely a sinister, dark, even depressing novel, not precisely because of the disturbing scenes, and there definitely are a lot of disturbing scenes, some scenes uh, in the section we read this week, uh, the scene in the toilet, um, uh, so many others in the novel. Even more than because of all that, it's disturbing because of its implications, because of its dark themes, because of its view on the human nature, the, uh, the way it presents history and humanity 
as a never-ending run toward destruction, fueled by our own urges and pulses. There's hope definitely amidst all this darkness, and one passage I forgot to mention in, a last, uh, in the last video, but there are so many passages worth mentioning in this novel, is one where um, uh, Roger remarks on the fact that his love with Jessica is the closest he has ever got, it's, it's the most perceivable form of magic he has ever experienced, especially when this magic is compared to the uh, occultism and paranormal activities of all the people at the Meadows in the novel. But without losing the point, going back to the very audible narrator of the novel, to the fact that it keeps intervening and giving you its opinion, uh, what do you think about it? Some people uh, regard it as very pomo, very postmodernist, the fact that the novel keeps being interrupted by this audible narrator, but at the same time it is very much a 19th century device, you know, it happens all the time in novels by uh, Walter Scott, by George Eliot, by these writers, that you are reading the novel and they keep interrupting, the narrator keeps interrupting the events to give you his or her opinion maybe on a specific character, maybe he or she second guesses what you think about a character, maybe they think you're going to judge them harshly, and so they say, do not be too hasty with your judgment, because you need to know these or that. And these are things that when you study literature, especially when you study contemporary literature, you encounter all the time, uh, all the most experimental and bizarre uh, narrative techniques of all your favorite postmodern or post-post-post-postmodern writers. Uh, it turns out they were already common usage in the 13th century. Uh, but at the, uh, at the same time, what do you think? Do you perceive these interventions as, as, as very classical in tone and in usage or do you feel like they are jarring and do you feel like they make the novel appear more experimental and confusing and disorienting and connected to this idea uh, the same commenter called Dylan Clymer, who mentioned the uh, interactive nature of the novel, the fact that it keeps addressing you, it keeps speaking in the second person, mentioned that to him this creates a beautiful situation of interactivity, uh, a beautiful situation when you, where you feel a little bit like the character in a video game, like you are immersed yourself in these events, you are part of the novel, and I 100% agree. And the very curious thing on this front is that it short circuits a paradox, which I probably already mentioned in a past video, and which is articulated by a scholar, a great scholar called Mary Laurie Ryan, in a um, uh, text called Narrative as Virtual Reality. This is the second edition, the first one, if I remember correctly, is from 2001. Uh, in this text, Ryan argues that uh, she discusses the proce process of narrative immersion, the process by which you feel like you are inhabiting a fictional world and you are um, deeply connecting with the character and you are immersed in the events as they happen and you are uh, isolated from the outside world because you inhabit this fictional setting, and she contrasts uh, narrative immersion to interactivity. Texts that keep referring to the reader, such as many postmodern texts, and that reveal th themselves as texts that remind you that you're reading a novel, are interactive, and interactive texts cannot possibly be immersive at the same time, because, of course, when you are reminded that you're, writing, uh, you're reading a novel, in that moment you, uh, you cannot possibly be immersed in that world and maintain that illusion that you are living in that fictional reality. And make no mistake, I do believe that Ryan's paradox is very useful when you think about literature, it definitely changed the way I approach uh, reading, I approach literature in general, and Narrative as Virtual Reality is one of those academic texts I would recommend to any passionate reader, even if, if you're not a, an English student or if you're not in academia. At the same time, it is true that it is uh, sometimes possible to think of exceptions to this paradox. This does not make the paradox any less valuable, but it's still uh, important to, to think about these exceptions and to reflect upon them. And I do ask you, do you think that Gravity's Rainbow may be an exception? What I'm going to ask basically is, do you think that Pynchon's, the way Pynchon keeps referring to you and keeps using the second person, and I say Pynchon but I should say the narrator, but you know what I mean, the way the narrator keeps referring to 
the second person. Do you think it breaks the illusion of the novel? Do you think it makes it harder for you to care about these characters and to immerse yourself in this nightmarish and eerie reality? Or do you think it reinforces that process of immersion and that it actually makes you feel a bit like a video game character, like you're inhabiting this experience and this reality? Let me know in the comments. I'm very curious to hear your opinions on this and we'll talk about it later in the uh, next video uh, where I'll discuss and I'll respond to your contributions. Focusing more on the section we read these last two weeks, I do have to admit that I found it a bit more challenging than the first one, possibly because of its lack of iconic scenes, the adenoid scene, the banana breakfast, also some passages in this edition, most notably the ones with Blissero, are definitely uh, well, you know how we mentioned the fact that Gravity's Rainbow is mostly dark because of its themes? Well, it, it's also dark because of its scenes and because of the things it portrays, and here are some clear examples. But still, the images and the way different sections uh, share the same imagery and all the connections within the text is definitely beautiful. Uh, this is the kind of text where you could definitely underline maybe not every single sentence, but half of the sentences. And one of the things that I loved about this section and about, the, the, once again, the way the narrator keeps interacting with the reader is that Pynchon never feels preachy. Yeah, sometimes he give you, gives you his very strong opinions on war, on the, on the terrible nature of war, but hey, he is right, war is shit, basically. And he is not, he's never preachy in a way that some writers who were inspired by Pynchon and would definitely followed in his footsteps absolutely were. He is not that preachy as some later American writers who had this very strong moral sense and needed to tell you what was wrong with you. Uh, and I'm not going to name any name because that's only going to offend some people, which is up to a point understandable, uh, no one likes to hear their favorite writers getting this or their favorite artists or musicians or whatever. But hey, uh, to give you, uh, I, I, I mean, to be fair, it's not like, I, I'm a huge Pynchon fan, but it's not like Pynchon is flawless himself. Most notably, I feel that Gravity's Rainbow f suffers a bit from that phenomenon you encounter a lot in uh, great literature. Um, I'm thinking in particular of uh, Anna Karienina by Tolstoy, but I could give you examples from uh, Manzoni, I could give you examples from George Eliot, definitely from Scott. Uh, that phenomenon where you are reading a very long novel, a classical novel, and you encounter a passage that is maybe a few paragraphs long, maybe m more likely like 20 pages long, and the paragraph is very cryptic, it's not at all clear how it relates to the rest of the novel, it feels a lot like the writer was indulging herself of him or himself, and uh, yeah, part, part of you thinks that maybe you are simply not getting it, that, that maybe you should just appreciate it and suck it up. But another part of you is thinking, man, I wish an editor had gotten their hands on this. And I'm the first to admit that's blasphemy, that's the weaker side of me, the side that wants more easily enjoyable entertainment talking. But uh, yeah, I did think... Uh, I did think those blasphemous thoughts a couple of times in some of the passages in this section that I am fairly sure were written under the influence of some mysterious 1960s Mexican mushroom. Favorite passages from this section probably were the ones revolving around Roger and Jessica once again, but there's all... I, I most honestly do not remember fully, I remember some things, but I do not remember fully how their story develops in the course of the novel. When I read these passages there's an implied, an engineered element of doom <laughs> in these love passages between these two um, that makes you really feel for them because you, you feel like there's a certain doom looming on their horizon, be it death be it the, the fact that they're not going to stay together, be it what it is. I'm most certainly do not certain about that, make no mistake. Uh, not spoiling you anything, it's what I want to say. That makes these passages all the more heartfelt and all the more strong in their emotional impact. And the other great section from this um, great passage 
from this section, call it what you will, is actually the one I mentioned as very disturbing, the one with Blissero, which begins in a very cinematic way with a camera following a certain character and closes with the same character, fo uh, camera following the same character. In a way, the circularity of this section uh, basically makes it a small group movie inside the movie, inside the movie, a beautiful uh, matrioska of sorts. And I definitely feel like that section alone could work as a Pinchonian short story or excerpt, self-conclusive excerpt. But let me know about your favorite passages uh, from the section we read in the last few weeks and let me know what you thought about this section in general. Uh, two weeks from now I'll be filming a, a video describing my experience with um, Un Permo Casino uh, Hermann Göring, part two of the novel, and I'll be responding and interacting with your feedback to this video, with your comments, um, your feedback to the novel, basically. Uh, so do let me know what you think about it. Do let me know if you are having difficulties with it or if the enthusiasm keeps going. I hope it does. And thank you once again for all your responses and all your comments. Uh, and you may have noticed that I've posted the video on YouTube directly and not on Patreon as I planned, it was going to be uh, publicly accessible anyway, uh, but yeah, since I'm only going to publish these things every two weeks, it's not like people who are not interested in Gravity's Rainbow are going to be flooded with superfluous videos. If they are, I'm sorry, uh, genuinely, but anyway, I'll see you two weeks from now. The video is going to be posted on my YouTube channel as usual, and thank you as w once more for watching. Bye, guys. <laughs>